Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents, uh, which is uh, this episode is part of our FASD screening webinar series, or if I guess we call it part two of our uh, of our, our webinar series on on screening tools for FASD. Uh, the title for today's uh, webinar is Meconium Screening to Detect Heavy Fetal Alcohol Exposure. And we're bringing back with us uh, a few familiar faces uh, or vo familiar voices uh, in uh, Dr. Gideon Corin and Jody, uh, Joey Guerreri. And we have some new uh, voices with us, uh, sort of bringing some great information from Prince Edward Island with Dr. Janet Bryanton and some other information from the Myrex study with uh, Caitlin Delamo. Um, as always, we do record these webinars uh, and we post them on our Knowledge Exchange Network. And as I mentioned, this work is part of our uh, screen work uh, in developing screening tools uh, for FASD, which is all uh, some of our work that's funded with the uh, public with the help of the Public Health Agency of Canada. So we always want to thank them for their support of this work. Uh, all of the information about the CAFC's National Screening Toolkit for Children and Youth Identified and Potentially Affected by FASD can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. All of the various neurobehavioral screening tools, meconium, maternal drinking guide, etc., are all listed there, uh, as are all of the webinars and other information that we've been presenting over the last couple of years around these uh, screening tools. Today's episode, as I mentioned, is being recorded and will be posted on this page. Uh, that you see in front of you on the screen, uh, and uh, as always, as well, not as always. Uh, usually, our webinars are every Wednesday at eleven Eastern time. Today's a, we can call this a special presentation because we're off our normal schedule by posting one on on Friday at eleven. Um, but of course, as always, it will be recorded and posted on this page. And if you're ever looking for more information on CAFC's webinar series or what's coming up next, uh, you can always go to the CAFC website and click on the uh, CAFC Presents tool. You'll see a calendar of upcoming events. Uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter that uh, will provide you with email updates for uh, upcoming webinars or reminders for upcoming webinars and a link directly to the Knowledge Exchange Network, which is, of course, where you can find all of the information on these webinars. Um, as usual, we will ask you to, if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask questions, but we do require you to type them in. So, And I always uh, remind people to type them in as you think of them uh, so that you don't, A, forget them, and, and B, so we can see at what point during the presentation the questions are coming in. Uh, and uh, with uh, all of that introduction out of the way, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Gideon Korn, who is part of CAFC Steering Committee for our FASD work in or our work in FASD screening tools. Dr. Korn is from the Hospital for Sick Children and is a professor of pediatrics, pharmacology, and medicine at the University of Toronto, and he's also the founder and director of the Mother Risk Program. So I've, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Korn. Thank you very much, uh, Doug, and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, when we set up the screening effort uh, some six years ago, um, the first cut uh, identified that one of the biggest issues to do with alcohol and pregnancy is how do we know that mom drank, or even more accurately, how do we know that the baby was exposed to alcohol, excessive alcohol? and. Uh, not surprising, the meconium tool came up because at that stage it had already quite a few strong papers showing its epidemiological value, sensitivity, specificity, and so on. So what we want to do is to help you understand where we are now, to give you an update on the studies, because this effort by Public Health Agency of Canada is not just to come up and tell us as clinicians, here are tools, but also to bring them into the Canadian um, milieu coast to coast. In the case of meconium, how are we going to use it? How are we going to see that Canadian physicians, healthcare, and other forces are using it? So it all makes sense uh, to start with a small background, not making assumptions that you uh, heard even about the test, although I suspect you did. And for that, uh, I'll uh, bring forward my colleague and friend, uh, Joey Guerreri. Joey is uh, the coordinator and uh, really the leader of our laboratory doing, doing these tests. While doing it, he's also almost completing his PhD at the University of Toronto on that topic. So Joey will give us some of the really important point for introduction about the meconium as a material and a method to screen coast to coast in Canada. Joey. 
Thank you very much, Giddy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, ultimately, we're dealing with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and trying to find best ways to serve the population of children that are uh, that are affected. The first step of serving them is, is of course, diagnosing. Um, there is a, a huge importance to determining prenatal alcohol use history. Now, in diagnosing fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, the presence of the three characteristic facial features associated with this disorder, that is short palpable fissures or small eye, a smooth or flattened philtrum, as the philtrum is the canal from the nose to the upper lip. In children with FAS, that area is very smooth pronounced in a pronounced way. And a thin vermilion border, which the vermilion is the upper lip. Uh, so the presence of these three craniofacial features is diagnostic for fetal alcohol syndrome. The problem is that only 10% of children affected by alcohol actually show the craniofacial abnormality. 90% of alcohol-affected children and adults appear physically normal. And for these individuals, evidence of significant prenatal exposure to alcohol is a requirement in order to obtain the diagnosis, uh, in addition to measurable dysfunction across multiple neurodevelopmental domains. Meconium is a complex matrix. It's, a, uh, it's the first bowel movement of a newborn after birth, and it consists of what was deposited in the fetal intestine from the 12th week of pregnancy onward. It begins to form at around the 12th week when fetal swallowing begins in the, um, in the womb. So first trimester histories are not included in meconium samples. Uh, they only represent what may have happened after the 12th week of pregnancy. There are some advantages over blood and urine in dealing with meconium. One is that it's a discarded material. It's relatively easy to collect and non-invasive. Collection of urine from newborns can be quite challenging. They only have a very small amount of blood um, that you want to be testing just from a collection standpoint. But in addition to that, blood is not very sensitive for picking up alcohol exposure. The reason we want to test meconium is because of the rapid elimination of alcohol from the body. Our bodies eliminate alcohol on average at a rate of about half a drink per hour. What this means is that someone who has a binge episode of drinking, that would be five drinks in about an hour, would have a zero blood alcohol within about 10 hours and no detectable alcohol in their urine within about 12 hours after this drinking episode. So this means that urine testing for ethanol which is routinely available in most hospitals, um, exhibits very low sensitivity. If you find a newborn or a mom uh, with alcohol in the urine, that indicates she was recently drinking, but a negative result does not effectively rule out alcohol exposure. FAEE are metabolites of alcohol. They are the combination of ethanol and fatty acids that are present in the body that combine to form fatty acid ethyl esters. So mom drinks, the alcohol crosses the placenta, combines with fatty acids in the fetus and deposits into the fetal meconium. The detection window is the, is the big difference in alcohol testing in meconium versus urine testing. The maximum detection window for meconium is about six months most studies show meconium likely reflects the last three months of pregnancy, but that has not been specifically determined for, for FAEE. So it's anywhere from three to the last six months of pregnancy that, that's uh, reflected in a meconium test. Um, urine tests for alcohol, like I showed, is about 12 hours. Even ethylglucuronide in urine, which is a newer toxicological test, has a window of about two or three days in urine after an alcohol use episode. There have been a number of studies that have validated the use of meconium to determine uh, evidence of maternal drinking in pregnancy. Um, Bearer and Klein published in the late 90s correlating FAEE and meconium with alcohol consumption. Um, 
there are a number of different FAEEs that are looked at. Ethyl linolate and ethyl oleate are, uh, are two examples of those. Daphne Chan in 2003 and 2004 showed that there are naturally present amounts of FAE in the meconium, and that is due to some small amounts of alcohol that our bodies produce as a byproduct of digestion. So an unexposed newborn can have up to two nanomoles per gram of FAE in their meconium. A result of one or 1.5 would be considered a negative result. Results above two are consistent with frequent exposure to alcohol in pregnancy. Uh, FAE also have been shown not to cross the placenta, so we know that they are a true measure of fetal exposure to alcohol, not just maternal consumption of alcohol. Um, in terms of FASD-related effects, there is an inverse correlation shown in animal studies. As FAE results are elevated, fetal brain weight in guinea pigs goes down, so it's showing an association with brain damage in an animal model. A number of human studies have been done showing a number of neurodevelopmental effects um, in newborns associated with positivity in FAEE uh, in meconium, including uh, psychomotor development up to two years of age, and correlations with FAS and partial FAS diagnosis at five years of age. So currently, meconium FAE analysis has been used in multiple research projects to examine the prevalence of frequent prenatal alcohol exposure in various Canadian and international populations, and we'll see a number of these studies throughout the rest of this webinar. The large detection window makes FAE meconium particularly suitable to this kind of study. FAE and drug analysis in meconium is also commonly used clinically to establish prenatal exposure to drugs of abuse and alcohol. Dozens of hospitals across Canada um, use meconium testing. Testing is currently targeted, so it's based on suspicion of prenatal exposure as secondary to routinely available toxicology. So where a physician would normally, uh, 20 years ago, only have ordered a urine test for alcohol or cocaine if it was clinically warranted, now they can order a meconium analysis um, if those results are negative. Samples tested for FAE should be collected within 24 hours of birth because there is a risk of false positive results uh, after 24-hour collection, and this is due to colonization of the gut by bacteria in the newborn. When the baby's born, the gut is sterile. Um, and the initial meconium formed in the first 24 hours is truly a reflection of uh, prenatal alcohol exposure. After 24 hours, bacteria begin to colonize the gut and they produce alcohol as what, in addition to what's already there. So you can have a higher risk of false positive results after 24 hours. Children testing positive for FAE are recommended to offer, undergo fetal alcohol spectrum disorder assessment after the age of three years. So any child with a positive result is not diagnosed as having FASD just from prenatal alcohol exposure. They have to be evaluated. Um, over half of kids exposed to alcohol prenatally will not have FASD. So thank you all. This is my, the end of my introduction. I'll pass it back over to Dr. Corn. So capitalize on uh, Joey's uh, opening remarks. Um, we will hear most of this hour uh, the aspects of epidemiology and how this really helps us uh, figuring out the kids at risk in this country and for that matter in other countries. But I do want to emphasize that this does not mean to be just an epidemiological tool as Joey already mentioned. Uh, child protection agencies are using it routinely because for them this is the most objective way to know what happened uh, during ut in utero life, and often it's associated with decisions that have to be made about the child. But the question is, we are now screening in this country and most other countries for things such hypothyroidism that occur one in 4,000 babies, for phenylketonuria, which occur one in 20,000, 
why don't we routinely screen all kids for the most common dysfunction at birth, alcohol, which is one in 100 to maybe one in 500. So I'm just throwing on those ideas. There are many reasons to have a very in-depth review about this, ethical, practical, and so on. But the important point is, and I want to plant it into those of you who have not heard that before, the earlier you diagnose a kid at risk for fetal alcohol syndrome, the better the results of the interventions that done on him. This was shown repeatedly by different people, most notably Anne Straska, one of the big gurus of the fetal alcohol syndrome in Seattle. So early diagnosis and detection is early intervention. And we do have a protocol whereby we are attempting this, and I should tell you we already identified and published um, one case of a kid that had very high levels who ended up uh, being uh, followed up. Uh, and actually, Joey will report on that later on when he, we talk about the Gray Bruce study. With that in mind, uh, I want to move to Eastern Canada, um, uh, to Prince Edward Island, and to introduce to you uh, Janet Bryanton. Janet is an associate professor of nursing and I should say a true leader of public health as related to her province and to Canada at large. And uh, Janet, when she heard about the advantage and progress with meconium uh, for the detection of heavy exposure, approached the public health agencies of Canada and through, and through our effort, which is under the same, uh, the same umbrella, we work together to make their protocol possible to do as part of our program, because this screening project is not just about telling people what tests will work, but also to see how they work in a Canadian context. So without any further delay, it's very exciting. Uh, Janet and her team just finished the study, and I think it's a very important study on a PI meconium. Janet. Thank you very much, Dr. Corn. It's really great to be here with everyone today. And I'm going to be presenting uh, a bit about the process of the study so that if someone wanted to replicate it in another province, they'd have some how-tos, as well as the results of our study and uh, where we've gone since we finished the study. <clears throat> I really want to make sure that I acknowledge the team that was involved in our study, first of all. It was a multidisciplinary team. Um, from the UPI School of Nursing, PEI Reproductive Care Program, Queen Elizabeth and Prince County Hospitals. They're the two hospitals on Prince Edward Island where births occur. And Dr. Kathy Bigsby was the co-PI in this study, and she really was the brainchild. She heard Joey present at a conference. She came back. She said, we have to do this. And I kind of helped to work to make that happen. And also we had Joey from Mother Risk Lab on the team, which was really an essential element to make this study a success, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, I do want to acknowledge our funding, and we really do appreciate the funding we received for the study through the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers um, and through the, the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. Also, the nurses on the maternity units at the three hospitals where we collected data, we could not have done this study without them. They did all the data collection, and uh, the study would have been way too expensive if we hadn't have had the goodwill of the nurses to help us do that. We also had three tremendous site coordinators who um, took this on and really led the charge for it, so I want to make sure they get acknowledged. So what were we trying to do? We wanted to conduct an anonymous, population-based provincial study, and that was those, those words are really key, over a year to determine the incidence of PEI newborns exposed to heavy or binge drinking during the second and third trimesters. And that makes sense in the context of what um, Joey just presented around meconium uh, testing. And what, you know, why do we really want to look at this? Because there was a notion on PEI that we did not have a problem with drinking in pregnancy, nor did we have a problem with FASD in our province. And Dr. Kathy Bigsby, who is a pediatrician, uh, really felt very strongly that uh, people needed to have some evidence to really start to make a movement here. 
So we wanted to identify the number of babies at risk for FASD and PEI, and as, as important is to uh, increase awareness of the significance of FASD. Provide us with a baseline to begin to make some movement here regarding um, prevention and programs and future research. And also, um, because of our funding through the National Toolkit Project, we're very proud to be able to advance the science of meconium testing. We also hope in the future that it will ultimately improve maternal child outcomes here on PEI and also across Canada and, and in other places in the world. Why is our study um, so unique? It's because it was the first province-wide study in Canada to actually involve meconium sampling from all live newborns for a full year. There have other studies that have been done, and Joey will talk about one. Um, they're, they, they're regional, or they've been done on high-risk populations or certain populations, but ours is the full province, and we were able to do it for a full year. The other thing that's important to understand is when our moms, if our moms need uh, tertiary care or babies need tertiary care, they're sent to the IWK in Halifax. So for us to get a full population-based study, we needed to get support from the IWK folks to allow us to have meconium collected on our babies that had been either transferred in utero or following birth. So that was an important part of this study. So the focus was on the population of newborns. We weren't trying to test individual babies. We were really looking to see what does our population, what is it like here on PEI with respect to drinking and, and uh, babies being exposed during, during pregnancy. Because meconium sampling, as Joey said, is non-invasive, we were actually able to conduct an anonymous study. And that was really key because we knew that if we asked mom, uh, needed to ask moms for consent, permission to collect a sample as we would if it had been another type of sample, that women who were drinking heavily during pregnancy likely would not have allowed us to do that. So um, by having a 100% anonymous study, we were actually able to get samples um, in a population-based format, which is what we were looking for. Um, so we have no way of associating a mother or baby with any sample that we collected. And we we had to be really, really careful to ensure that these samples were anonymous. And, and as I go through, I'll, I'll show you how we did that. To start the study, we needed ethics approval, and we were able to get that through three ethics committees on PEI and at the IWK. So with respect to the anon uh, anonymity, we recorded absolutely no identifying information. Um, and therefore, the samples, we cannot associate the samples with any woman, any baby, any site. We do not know the samples that came from the IWK or from either of the two hospitals on PEI. And people sometimes say, well, it would have been, wouldn't it have been better to be able to be able to link some of this information to get a better picture. We had to make that decision early along that if we were really wanting to get a true picture of the incidents on Prince Edward Island for a year, we really needed it to be anonymous and we were prepared to move forward on that basis. So because it was anonymous, we were basically collecting um, meconium or poop from diapers. We did not need a consent process and that was a key and important part of the study. The sample containers were numbered, um, but that was only so that mother risk, when they were doing their analysis, could um, actually associate a number with a positive or a negative sample. And what we did to ensure that no number was associated with a hospital or a site, we actually randomly distributed the containers to the three hospitals so that we couldn't you know, identify a site with that. Um, and the other decision that we made is that we would only look at total um, FAEs with respect to um, this study and not look at other things such as uh, drug use. So how do we go about it? We collected meconium from the diapers of live, live newborn babies from 8 o'clock on November 8, 2010 to 7.59 on November 8, 2011. Again, very, when you're doing a population-based piece of work and you want to get an incidence for a year, your timing is very important. 
Because babies are born 24-7, we needed to collect data 24-7. So we had to think about how we would collect data on every baby that was born 24-7. And again, that's why the nurses were so critical. So we enlisted the support of the nurses on the maternity units at the Queen Elizabeth and Prince County Hospitals and the NICU at the IWK Hospital. And they, it, this collection actually became part of the routine care of every baby over the year of the study. And these nurses really are the key to the success of this study, and I can't tell you how important it is to, to have their support. Um, we spent a lot of time initially trying to figure out how we could um, develop a collection method that was going to be easy and consistent. And, and really, our, our key around the consistency was very important. And Joey and Dr. Korn were essential in helping us come up with this, um, these ideas. So what we ended up doing is we actually uh, pre-assembled meconium collection kits. Our team uh, got together and we had pizza and we tried to have a team spirit. We actually put these collection kits together ourselves, um, and they were actually put in the um, admission kits of all the, the, um, on the three uh, units that we were doing the data collection. So we needed to collect 10 mils of meconium from a single meconium, and the size was about the size of a toonie or an Oreo. Um, we needed one sample per baby. It didn't have to be the first meconium, but we did know that the earlier the better. And at that point in time, um, there wasn't as much focus on the first 24 hours, but we know now that um, that really is, is very important in the science of meconium. So we did try to collect the, the earliest meconium that we could. Uh, it didn't matter if urine was present and it didn't need to be sterile. We came up with, um, Joey told us we needed to have a container that was opaque and we actually found a container that was um, um, an ointment container that we were able to buy, and there was a false bottom in it. So the, the actual amount that was in the container was about the 10 cc, so it worked out very well. And we used a tongue depressor for the nurses to take the meconium and put into the container. On the front of the container, the only thing that was there was the number that was associated with that specimen, and we also put the baby's approximate age and hours, and that was to help um, mother risk when they were doing the analysis to make the decision around the um, timing of the birth and, and the positive or negative aspect with respect to the sample. We didn't put anything else on the label. It was uh, the label. It was put in a baggie and into a uh, deep freeze, minus 20 degrees Celsius. And that was done, I mean, usually it was done immediately, but it was supposed to be done within 12 hours of collection. We had to really figure out a way to make sure that we knew we collected a sample, but at the same time, we didn't want to um, risk anyone being identified if a sample hadn't been collected. So what we did is we put a green dot on the cardex, on the um, newborn's cardex, if a sample had been taken and nothing was written on that cardex. It, we, can, we decided that if a, a parent refused to have a sample taken, a, blue, a green dot would also be placed on the cardex, and a, a check mark would be put in a, we had a binder that we, we would put a check mark to indicate anyone that had, had refused to have a sample taken. So it was really, we had to work around a lot of the logistics to keep the anonymity associated with it, but also keep uh, very strict attention to any samples that we might have missed during the collection period. So there's nothing else put anywhere. Before we began, we really knew we had to do some work with the nurses to um, do some education to be sure that we had consistency in collection. And again, Joey and Dr. Korn were critical to this process and gave us a lot of really good advice. Uh, initially, we knew we'd need to get buy-in from the nurses because we were talking about adding another step to their already busy workload. So what we did, it, our site coordinators, we did a half-hour education session with every nurse. A lot of it was done in groups, but much of it was done one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. We had, we had great audiovisual aids. We had a diaper with, uh, they put Play-Doh, gray Play-Doh in the diaper to represent the meconium just for a visual aid to help the nurses see how much they had to collect. 
We really aim for consistency in collection. We spent time answering questions, and we developed a study binder that was left on the unit so that the staff could leap through it at any point in time, and we included other additional information that they may um, be interested in reading. We also had ongoing education, and again, this was Joey's recommendation that um, sometime, over time, nurses kind of might forget what to do or not be as consistent with it. So we had different methods to try to keep that education going. We had signs up, remember to scoop the poop. We became known as the poop study, and even in the media, we've been called that. We had candy, and again, these the, these were ideas of my site coordinators. The candy were like um, Hershey's Kisses, but it looked like little plods of meconium, so they were put out on the units. Uh, we gave the staff positive feedback. Every three months, we did FAQs, and we had um, a gift basket. Nurses like getting getting gifts and prizes, so we had a quiz. And if they got everything correct on the quiz, then their name went into a, ba uh, a draw and they were able to win a gift. Um, initially, the nurses questioned whether we really needed to be doing this. Um, they were concerned about the fact that we didn't require parent consent cause, and needed a fair bit, a bit of uh, reassurance that we were ethical in our approach. And... Um, they were very, very concerned about doing it right. And this was all the way through the study. They kept saying, are we doing okay? And and I would, uh, Joey can attest to this, I would email Joey and I'd say, Joey, how are we doing? And he would assure us that the samples that we were giving them was good quality. And uh, they, they were very, very concerned about it. We had two study mo mottos. The earliest, the biggest, the best is the aim. And when in doubt, don't throw it out. And those were put... Uh, throughout the unit so that um, nurses would be reminded. We had educational resources developed for parents as well. We had a study poster, um, several posters up on the units, and this poster was adapted from the Yukon Meconium Screening Project. We also had pamphlets for parents, and we didn't actually pass these out to every parent, but if a parent was questioning or needed more information about the study, um, then we would give the parent uh, an information pamphlet. Parents could opt out. If if a parent absolutely said, I do not want you to collect that meconium, we would have respected that. Um, but usually, if there were any concerns, the nurses were able to discuss the study with the parents, give them the pamphlet, and we had no documented refusals throughout the whole study. And actually, very few uh, pamphlets were used. So parents generally were okay with the process. We also did staff education with physicians, and um, our two pediatricians who were on the team did medical rounds at the hospitals. They um, did informal discussions with obstetricians, pediatricians, and family physicians because we really felt we needed the buy-in from the medical community as well to make the study work. We put an article in the Medical Society newsletter and in hospital newsletters. So over the year, we actually collected 1,307 samples that we shipped to Mother Risk every two weeks. So we batched the samples in dry ice and we couriered them to Mother Risk um, <clears throat> over that time. We um, know for certain that we missed 11 samples. Uh, and what we actually did is if a staff member knew that they missed a sample or if it was discovered that a sample had been missed, they um, put a tick mark again in the binder because, again, we didn't want a name associated with it, so we put a tick mark in the binder and put the reasons. So mainly the reasons that were that the staff forgot or the sample got misplaced or it didn't get frozen in time. As well, and this is really important around the science of meconium, is that there were at least seven samples that we were not able to collect. And that was mainly because um, sometimes babies will have a meconium in utero, and if it's large enough, they may not actually have another meconium after they're born. And that occurred in some situations. Or sometimes they had a big meconium at birth and it wasn't able to be collected in the birthing suites. Um, we also had a few infants who had conditions that didn't allow collection. So, for example, it might be a baby with a bowel obstruction or a baby with an imperforate anus. And at that point in time, when they have the baby in the OR, they're really not too concerned about trying to get a meconium sample for our study. 
but I think it 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 makes people aware that there are situations that maybe you may not be able to get a meconium sample collected. So what did our study show? Um, of the 1,307 samples that were received by Mother Risk, they were able to um, accurately analyze 1,271. So there were 36 samples, or 2.8%, that they weren't able to test properly or didn't feel right about reporting because they didn't have enough qual uh, quantity or the sample wasn't meconium, it was transitional stool, or the results were just inconclusive. So of the 1,271 samples, uh, it was found that 39 samples, or 3.1%, were collected or were positive for FAEs at less than 24 hours. And that's the, the key that Joey was, was mentioning when he did his presentation, that, that we know that those are true positives. Um, we also know that there were 56 samples, or 4.4%, that were collected at any time post-birth that were positive. But because we're not certain that they are truly positive, we made a decision as a team that we would only report the 39 samples that were collected less than 24 hours as being FAE positive. So when we did our media and that, we really only went with 39 samples. Um, so based on Joey's input um, and previous research, it's expected that about 40% of babies who are exposed or have FAE positive meconium will actually exhibit FASD. So we back calculated and we made the statement, therefore, that at least 16 babies born during the study year will likely exhibit FASD, which is about 1.3% of the total uh, 1,271 that were analyzed accurately by um, mother risk. So that's comparable to the prevalence of FASD in the general population. It's also comparable to the results that Joey did in the Gray Bruce region, which he's going to be talking about. Um, and what it said to us is, yes, we do have women drinking, and yes, we do on PEI have FASD. And that has been very, very good for people to hear. Why was our study so such a success? Well, one thing is we had the right team, the right people, the right mix of people on the team. People were committed. We had great site coordinators. And if you're trying to do a study like this, these, these decisions are so key up front to make sure that you have the right people on your team. Um, Joey was invaluable to us. And Dr. Corin, before we even started the study, he said, I need to send Joey to PEI and spend a day with you to talk about lessons learned from his work and suggestions. And that really was key to the work that we did. We had a great commitment to quality. We knew we needed every sample or almost every sample for us to get a true incidence. And I have to say that we were all very committed to that. Um, as well, the nursing staff were extremely committed. We had one nurse on one unit as the baby was being born. He was having a meconium, and she swooped underneath the obstetrician and snatched a sample of meconium from the, for the study. So that just gives you an idea of how committed these nurses were to making this study work for us. There were a few lessons learned. And one was that it's not we're not always able to collect a sample of uh, of McConey from babies. And our team, I mean, Joey probably knew, but we hadn't really thought of this beforehand and, and that it does identify limitations of the McConey collection. The other thing is that when you're working with preterms, and the people at the IWK really had to work hard to get some of these samples, that if these babies are really preterm, they may not have 10 mils of meconium, or it may take 10 days to get that, to get that sample. So that, that certainly was a lesson. So next steps, our study serves as a baseline for an integrated approach here on PEI to prevention, early identification and intervention for FASD, and to future research and policy initi initiatives that will affect PEI, but also, we hope, beyond PEI. Um, we know we really need to focus on FASD prevention using a very broad, intersectoral, multifaceted approach at all levels of prevention. We're presently disseminating our study um, public and to for public and professional audiences. Um, we plan to publish, and that will be in the near future. 
but we've had uh, great media uptake. And again, we developed a good relationship with the media during the time we were doing the study. And um, this, the um, media that we've had on this study has been very, very good, and it's created a lot of good discussion here on PEI, but quite broadly, actually. Um, we were interviewed on CBC. Um, it went local. It went regional. We did French CBC. We The CBC TV actually went to a national news feed, which went uh, across Canada, but I've had... Um, I've had emails from people in New Zealand, people, local people, people from across Canada asking about the study. It, um, it's really created a lot of dialogue here. Um, if anyone has read any of the, the follow-ups to the news feed, or um, we actually had a feature article on the front page of our local newspaper that was also electronic. We've had, there's been a lot of public discussion. Um, some of it you don't want to read, but it really gives you a sense of the public perception about this issue. Um, and I believe it's really raised the profile of, of FASD in our province and also uh, the fact that we have women who are drinking during pregnancy, women who have probably very complex lives that need support. They need us to help them with this issue for us to make um, an inroad here. So our hope is just to keep the momentum going. And, um, you know, so far we've had a really good um, luck with that, and, and we're hoping that we will continue with it. Uh, thank you. All right, thanks, Janet. Um, this is just my opportunity to uh, remind uh, everyone to, uh, to type your questions in when, when, when you think of them. And I can also, I'd also like to mention that uh, a couple times it's been raised about the ethical issues around uh, meconium screening, and there have there are a couple of webinars that we have posted on our Knowledge Exchange Network that really focused in on uh, the ethical issues around uh, collection of meconium and, and its use in screening. So be sure to check those out. So, uh, uh, Dr. Corn, I'm not sure if you have any comments here, or if we're ready to move on to the next uh, section. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, uh, Janet, for an amazing presentation, and I appreciate not just the results, but also. We all learn from seeing how studies are done, and th this is clearly not an easy study to do. And and then the last and most positive, as you mentioned, is here's a, a province that you guys and we kind of heard you saying the awareness was not very high, but here, by going and doing something throughout the province, engaging health professionals and other workers, the media, it's raised awareness, so you can much more effectively do the primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, and hopefully other things too, such as diagnostic and other. With that in mind, uh, we'll move to Joey. Joey actually, as Janet mentioned several times, did the preceding study. Um, I'll just tell you, um, the preceding study was done at the Gray Bruce area of Ontario, which Joey will present to you. The context here is a little bit tragic. Uh, you may remember it's that region of Ontario where the where the E. coli outbreak uh, happened, uh, uh, preceding our study, which made the public health authorities there very, very aware of public health and uh, its elements. So when we presented the meconium uh, at the Grey Bruce in uh, Owen Sound, uh, the, the the leader or the leadership really said, can you do it here? Which we, of course, were very happy to hear. Because as you heard from Janet, you really need buy-in by everyone in order to make those studies uh, possible. Joey, in addition to the public health and epidemiology of it, will also describe, as I mentioned before, some of the other uses beyond epidemiology in an anonymous way. Joey. Thank you, Giddy. This series of projects really uh, illustrates the evolution of uh, taking the meconium test from a simple uh, epidemiological research tool to actually serving the needs of uh, children with neurodevelopmental uh, deficits. The, um, to those of you who are unfamiliar, the Grey Bruce region is an area in uh, southwestern Ontario. Here's a blow up of it. That uh, 
the primary site there is, is Owen Sound. Um, and in this unit is where we did a collection of samples very similar to what you saw for PEI. Uh, this study was done in conjunction with the Gray Bruce Health Unit uh, and actually at their request. This was a general population anonymous screening study. So uh, the, the PEI study was modeled on this particular study, although I have to say their collection was, uh, was much more successful than ours. Um, because of the amount of extra relationship they had with their hospital staff and the nurses. Um, so informed consent was not required and we looked, uh, we collected samples from all babies born in the region of Grey Bruce over a one year period. Um, and again, all the samples were collected anonymously. No identifying information was that was collected in order to maximize participation and determine the most accurate incidence value uh, possible for this region. We collected and analyzed a total of 682 samples and got 17 positive results for FAEE and meconium. This gave us a fetal alcohol exposure rate of approximately 2.5 percent in that population. To give you an idea of the kind of public health information that was available prior to this study, we also collected the public health data from that year. The only mechanism of obtaining information about alcohol use in pregnancy was a single question on the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children questionnaire asking yes or no, was there any diagnosed drug or alcohol abuse in pregnancy? And only five of a thousand women giving birth that year in the region uh, had a yes answer. So that's not just alcohol, but drugs as well. So we can see that information being directly provided to the health unit was a five-fold underestimate of the number of uh, babies born uh, potentially impacted by alcohol. Several studies uh, be between the late 80s and late 90s have estimated that FASD affects about one in 100 children in, uh, or people in North America. Uh, Abel proposed that approximately 40% of alcohol exposed infants, this is with relatively frequent alcohol exposure, will have an FASD diagnosis. So it's really important to emphasize that uh, knowing that there was alcohol exposure does not mean that a child will have FASD. They have to be assessed and diagnosed later on in life. Um, only 4% will have the craniofacial features, but 40% will have FASD. So if we take the 2.5% that we uh, assessed as being exposed to alcohol in Grey Bruce uh, times a 40% risk of having FASD, we can estimate that about 1% of this population um, has FASD. We followed up this initial study uh, with a secondary study in a high-risk population. Now what happened is the children of high-risk pregnancies did not actually deliver in the region of Grey Bruce. They get diverted south to London, Ontario to a tertiary care facility affiliated with the University of Western Ontario for labor and delivery. So our initial study population excluded uh, high-risk pregnancy. So we decided to follow up the initial study with looking at high-risk pregnancies uh, delivering in London, Ontario that were from the region of Grey Bruce. This study was published in 2010. And what we found is we had very similar participation rates, but the rate of FAE positivity in the NICU population was actually about tenfold higher than in the general population. About 30% of babies uh, tested positive for FAE. We found that from that study we saw that this was a, a great population to pilot an interventional screening program because of the high rate of positivity. So the third in this series of studies was an opt-in model screening and follow-up program with informed consent, non-anonymous, offering early life follow-up services through the public health unit of Grey Bruce. 
We saw this as an opportunity to attempt to model a screening and follow-up program to address FASD from birth. Neurodevelopmental assessment after age three would be offered to these children at our FASD clinic at the uh, hospital for sick children. What we found from this study is we, uh, as opposed to the anonymous screening model, the participation rate dropped significantly with less than 80% of um, moms agreeing to have the baby screened. Also, the, the positivity rate dropped significantly from the NICU population. So what we see here is that automatically by doing an open informed consent screening program, we do lose a large proportion of children that are alcohol exposed from being detected. What we did find is even with the reduced level of participation, there were significant benefits for those that did participate. I'll just go over the study model for you. So a woman enters the birthing site, and if she was from Gray Bruce, she was provided information about the study and uh, opportunity to provide informed consent and enroll. So either she would enroll or she would not. There's, of course, no consequence for not enrolling in the study. Um, if she did consent, meconium was collected and tested for FAE using our standard method. If the sample was positive, the child was referred to the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program offered through the public health unit for a six-year follow-up. So we didn't actually have to create a follow-up program. All we had to do was divert this child into an existing program that was there through the public health unit. And the child is offered neurodevelopmental testing at three months, one and a half years of age, and continuing on as long as it was required. So it's this type of interagency collaboration that really, uh, really uh, showed where the future of this type of work might be lying. If any delays were detected, an intervention program uh, was initiated for the child with diagnostic services and support services for the mother. About 45 women in total were screened, and one child tested positive. So here is the story of that one FAE positive infant. The test result was 52 nanomoles per gram. Positive cutoff is two. So this child was well into the positive range. At three months of age, the child exhibited normal development. At six months, there was a slight delay in fine motor skills. And by eight months, the public health nurse noted delays in gross motor skills and speech. At 14 months, the child was again assessed and still had gross motor ability issues and expressive language delays. So this child was enrolled in infant development program and will be referred immediately for speech and language services. So this is a child that potentially, if not enrolled in this study, uh, may not have had um, ongoing primary care in the first few months of life and may not have actually received any of these services until they were uh, well further along, possibly even school age, which is a typical story. This is the one child that tested positive out of 45 kids that were studied. That's a huge hit rate for screening and actually detecting a child that um, had a measurable issue. That's a 2% that's a success rate in the study. Uh, if you compare it, about 140,000 newborns are screened in Ontario every year, um, and less than 100 of them are diagnosed with actionable conditions, and that includes the full panel of 29 conditions that is screened for by the province of Ontario. So although preliminary and, and by no means final, the initial uh, examination of using FAE as a screening tool showed some significant upside in uh, mobilizing services uh, to moms that were brave enough to consent and, and uh, take the help that was offered to them. So some final thoughts before I pass it over to uh, Caitlin. Um, universal anonymous FAE meconium screening, as you've seen through Janet's and these studies, is quite a valuable tool in determining prenatal exposure incidents in whole populations. Conversely, non-anonymous 
Screening is uh, likely to be ineffective in establishing any accurate incidents, but has shown promise in identifying affected children in an, in an early stage. And even if we're not finding all of them, uh, we, are we are highly likely to find kids that would otherwise go undetected. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Corin, Dr. Hazel Lynn, the uh, Medical Officer of Health of Gray Bruce, who really pioneered uh, this whole action uh, in her region. Um, Dr. Ingrid Goh and Irene Zellner, who conducted uh, two of the studies, and Dr. Henry Rukima, our collaborator from St. Joseph's Health Center in London. Um, now, if uh, Doug, if there's no questions, I could pass it directly over to Caitlin, or I'll pass it actually over to Dr. Corin for comments. Thank you so much, uh, Joey, for this uh, very succinct and uh, overview of all stages. And um, just as, a, as, a, as an editorial comment, it's not really surprising that many women offered an open screening may not want to participate, which is, of course, intuitively expected. But Joey makes a good point that even with the hit rate there, uh, as the example of a single kid show as of now, uh, this is very important because you, you can do something for them. And early intervention means uh, much better secondary prevention. Um, the last chapter of this particular uh, webinar deal with uh, Canada now coast to coast to coast. Um, you saw two provinces. The point to take on is how similar the rates are. Uh, Ray Bruce, Ontario, and PI, several years apart, almost mathematically identical numbers, which confers that about 3% of our babies are exposed heavily. Do remember, in the second and third trimester, possibly more in the first before mom knew she was pregnant. And uh, some people reflect this as a weakness of the system, you can flip it and say, mom that continued to drink after she became aware of a pregnancy, this is a sin equinon of drug dependence, of alcohol dependence. And these are really our primary target population. So, so, so in a way, we are even more targeted on those that need the targeting. Um, about a year and a half ago, through our um, steering group, I, may, I became aware of a large study done. Uh, the center is uh, Dr. Bill Fraser uh, at uh, University de Montréal, together with Ty uh, uh, Arbenzen Arbenkel out of uh, Health Canada, a prospective study that collected, and uh, Caitlin will give you some more details in a second, but basically a coast-to-coast -coast study that looked at toxicological risk for an unborn baby by collecting data. And of course, uh, when I heard the presentation, there was that moment that the term meconium was mentioned. And of course, they collected meconium for heavy metals and cotinine, not thinking about alcohol. And because this is a public affair and a public effort, Part of the ideology of that group was that other Canadian researchers can work with them on materials that remain after they do their analysis. So this is exactly what we have done. This part uh, is uh, an important component of Caitlin Delano's uh, PhD project at the University of Toronto. And I'll let Caitlin give you some more details about this project, which is still, of course, in progress. Thank you, Dr. Corin. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. So like Dr. Corin said, I'm gonna be talking about one of the projects I'm focusing on for my PhD studies, uh, which is looking at the prevalence of heavy alcohol use during pregnancy in Canada. Now this is a collaboration between MIREC and Mother Risk. Uh, the MIREC study uh, has started a few years back, and it is a national study. Now, this study wanted to look at the extent of chemical exposures in mothers and infants. So they collected various sample types, blood, urine, meconium, hair, uh, breast milk after birth, um, and they analyzed all these samples for heavy metals and nicotine coatening levels. Now, they had remnant samples left over, so they gave it 
open to other people to apply for the chance to use these remnants to do further studies. So we were fortunate enough to get access to the meconium samples as the Myrex study didn't actually analyze these samples for FAEs and alcohol exposures. Now, despite not analyzing for FAEs and alcohol exposure, they still included drinking habits in the questionnaire that was administered to the mothers. Um, they asked about the frequency of drinking during pregnancy, what types of alcohol they consumed, whether it be beer, wine, or liquor. And they also asked the number of times in the past three months that they had drank, and as well, the number of times that they've had five or more drinks on one occasion. So this really gave a nice overview of drinking habits of mom. And in, in the end, it's really a self-report of maternal drinking. So now with the possibility of analyzing these meconium samples and the questionnaire that the Myrex study looked at, we now have a nationwide study that we can do for heavy fetal alcohol exposure. So the objectives, objectives and hypotheses of our study, which is just in the beginning stages, uh, is really to determine the prevalence of heavy alcohol use during pregnancy in Canada. So we also have access to the neonatal outcomes and maternal reports from the pregnancy. So we're going to be correlating the FAE levels with the neonatal outcomes and as well with the maternal self-reports. So we hypothesize that the prevalence of heavy alcohol use during pregnancy will be in excess of 3%, as we had said previously, that approximately 40% of alcohol-exposed infants uh, have uh, only have FASD. So we're saying that about 3% of the population will actually have the indications of heavy alcohol exposure. Um, we also hypothesize that the meconium samples that have the higher levels of FASD FAEs will result in poor neonatal outcomes, and that, of course, these meconium results will identify more heavy alcohol use than the maternal self-report. So to do this, the Myrex study had collected the meconium sample in years past, and this is from 11 obstetric units in 10 cities across Canada. Um, the participating mothers completed questionnaires, and they had a a wide range of questions, like I said, about drinking habits, but along with sociodemographic information, smoking habits, um, it's endless, the questions that they ask. Uh, and then also we have the maternal and neonatal outcomes that were collected at the time of birth. So here at the Mother Risk Laboratory, we're going to be uh, analyzing all the meconium samples for FAEs. So we're going to be analyzing for the four predominant FAEs, which are listed here. And we're going to be looking at cumulative FAEs for the positive results. And we're also going to be looking at individual FAE concentrations for our correlations that we'll be performing. Um, and we are going to be using the positive cutoff of two nanomoles per gram of meconium that was established back by Daphne Chan. So we're going to first calculate the incidence of heavy and utero ethanol exposure. We're going to be doing this for nationwide and as well for each individual obstetric unit. This is to compare the regions within Canada to identify potential higher risk locations that may need more interventions in place in the future. And also we're going to be looking at the paternal and neonatal outcome data and correlating those between the FAE concentrations and the outcomes. And we're going to be doing this for both cumulative and individual FAE concentrations to see if there is any link between a particular FAE and predicting uh, poor neonatal outcome data. Now we're also going to be reviewing the questionnaire data that we received um, and determining the maternal self-report of alcohol consumption depending on how they answered the questions within the questionnaire. And then, of course, we're going to be comparing the FAE result and the corresponding uh, maternal self-report. So really, the significance of this study, it is the first national study that's going to be looking at heavy fetal alcohol exposure through meconium analysis. The opportunity to do this is amazing, and the fact that we have such a large number, we have 1,500 samples that we are able to analyze, we can really get a good out overlook of what's happening in our country nowadays with alcohol use during pregnancy. And also, we're going to be determining correlations, if there are any, between the FAE concentrations and the outcomes of the neonate. Of the neonate. So really, we can identify potential signs at birth of heavy fetal alcohol syndrome or alcohol exposure that may not have been known previously. 
So I just want to thank my supervisor, Dr. Corin, especially for giving me the opportunity to do this study, along with the numerous people that are uh, working with me at the Mother Risk Laboratory. I've also included a the last bullet point, the website for the MIRAC study, if you're interested to see um, how their study has come along, it's a very um, good website that gives you a wealth of knowledge about this project. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. Uh, back to you, uh, uh, Doug. Hey, thanks. Um, uh, we did have a question that came in right at the end of Joey's presentation, the second one on the Gray Bruce uh, study. Uh, Michelle was asking, did your studies capture uh, home births at all? Um, that's a great question. One of the uh, collection sites for my Gray Bruce study was the midwifery collective of the Gray Bruce region. So we actually reached out. There were five birthing hospitals in the region and one midwifery collective that serviced the region, and they were one of our sample collectors. So we actually did uh, collect home birth data uh, amongst our sample in the, um, in the general population study. All right. Well, thank you. That's the, uh, that's the only question we have uh, in the hopper right now. So again, a reminder for Doug, people. You have two questions that came to us uh, that I can address if it's okay. Um, the first was, uh, I was asked wh whether someone heard that uh, one of the risks of the meconium analysis is false positive. False positive means that you blame, quote unquote, or you label a child as exposed to alcohol, which means mom is a problematic drinker, where in fact she is not. I want to make it clear, uh, these, we are not aware of positivity, false positivity. What we are aware, and that's a study we published last year in the Alcohol Research Journal, the Blue Journal, where another graduate student, uh, Irene Zellner, took a series of kids at Mount Sinai Hospital and collected all their meconia up to the time of when they, it becomes stool. And what she shows there is really, as Joey touched upon, Meconia that was negative in the first day turns positive sometime in the second, third, and fourth day. Mm -hmm. So so clearly, positivity will be created, but that's later. That's not surprising. The babies, of course, nutrition is milk. Milk has sugars. The sugars plus the bacteria in the gut turns into, guess what, alcohol, which turns into FAEs. And and, and Irene showed it very, very nicely. If you, for example, put into that stool, uh, if you put into that stool antibiotics and kill the bacteria, it does not happen. She could show that with more feeding, we can measure directly more alcohol. So the only thing about false positivity, I would say the following. If we get meconium in the second and third days and it's negative, it's true negative. If it's positive on the second and third day, there must be a question mark, and that will be in our interpretation. The second question that come again, uh, again from concern, concerns about human rights is the question of ethicality. Uh, uh, it's one thing to do anonymous testing. It's another thing to do testing which is not anonymous. Um, uh, the, the Children Aid Society, when they do the testing, of course, have the legal authority to do it. They need to go often to, to court to get it. So again, it's not so much of an issue, because they at that time actually are the custodians of the child. The question is more large. Can you do it without mom's permission um, uh, at all? Um, this was never a challenge in a Canadian court, or to best my knowledge, in any court. So I cannot tell you what the, what the law will tell. But last year in the FACE meeting, Fetal Alcohol Canadian Expertise at PEI, we brought uh, Professor Dickens, uh, from Bernie Dickens from the University of Toronto, who is a lawyer and actually one of the biggest experts in the world on fetal rights and so on and so forth. And he applying the court cases that related to this case directly or indirectly, came up with a very clear conclusion that the meconium itself is a discarded tissue. It does not belong to the parents. And uh, 
and if the and because of the potential advantages to know this, his ruling was of course not in a court of law that it's okay and ethically sound to test. I'm sure that this is not acceptable by everyone, and it was not in the court. Uh, Bernie Dickens' paper is published uh, in the Journal of uh, Population Therapeutics and uh, Clinical Pharmacology in the section called Fetal Alcohol Research. It's a journal that we published, and you can find it on PubMed if you first search for Dickens Bernard uh, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome meconium. You will find the paper. So, so these were the two pa the, these were the two elements that came as questions. If I can summarize up, uh, Doug, um, it's important for clinicians to know of that tool. The tool is a very powerful tool, and in all fairness, the only objective tool we have, except for mums telling us, is a lot of reasons for mum may not want to tell us. And that brings again the issue of maternal fetal conflict, uh, which is very hotly debated. But I think for us as health professionals, social workers, child workers, uh, child protection workers, it's very important to know where the state of knowledge is. So it's important to say there is a tool, there is an objective tool which is very sensitive and specific that allow us to identify. Last but not least, we must know as a nation how many kids are affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. That will never happen, because for that to happen, you need to identify all the kids with the diagnosis. And across the country, we have only 40 clinics that diagnose. So most kids will continue to be undiagnosed. Here we have a surrogate, a biological marker, which allow us to know how many babies were exposed to heavy alcohol. It's those babies that will end up, part of them, about 40%, that have the syndrome. So it's fair to say that the measurement of meconium FAEs, probably for the visible future, will be the only tool that will tell provinces, nations, other jurisdictions, countries, how much of their babies are exposed to heavy alcohol, and secondly, how many will be affected by FASD. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Korn. Um, just uh, you know, again, we were referencing the um, the ethical present, uh, the ethics presentation with Bernard Dickens and uh, Anna Zed Unesky. I think I pronounced it right. Is a was another one of the participants on that that session that was about the ethics of meconium screening in Prince Edward Island, and that was recorded and is on the, the Knowledge Exchange Network that we have here, so anyone is interested in, in seeing that, dis or listening or watching that discussion, uh, along with the papers that uh, Dr. Korn mentioned, uh, it, it, it is up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Yeah. Uh, Elaine uh, Orbein is uh, from CAFC is with uh, me here. She did, she's did. she got a comment, I believe. Yeah. Thanks, Doug, and, and thanks to everybody. Um, once again, uh, to Joey and Janet, uh, Caitlin, and and, uh, and of course to you, Giddy. Thank you so much for just excellent presentations this morning. I just a couple of comments, and and maybe Janet, I can I can turn to you. Um, your study being the most recent uh, in the province of PEI, continuing what Dr. Corin is just sort of talking about the ethical issues and the fact that we have this reliable tool um, that we can really begin to address the important question of how many children in Canada, in fact, um, have FASD and, and more importantly, begin to inter, you know, intervene early and that sort of thing. Janet, what's your sense, having conducted this very comprehensive, large sample um, in terms of population study, what's your sense on the acceptance of, of meconium testing, sort of not anonymously, not when, when there's, there's a, an addiction or, or exposure um, suspected or detected, but routinely, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to use the term universal screening, although we We've certainly identified that as perhaps um, the ideal, but your sense on on the resistance, the complications, the 
the challenges and barriers that um, that we would face, just given your most recent experience? Um, it's too bad that Kath, Dr. Kathy Bigsby wasn't on the line because that that really would be a better question for her um, because she would face that more than I would in the university setting. I would have to say it depends on the group that you're speaking with. Yeah. I think um, pediatricians, people who are focusing on the, the newborn health, I think would be much more inclined to want to see some type of screening available on a more regular basis. When you're possibly looking at people who are looking at it from the woman's point of view, um, again, it's this fetal maternal thing that Dr. Corn talked about. Um, they would look more at the woman's rights and they, they might not be quite so happy about it. So mm -hmm. I guess it really, and I, I can't, the we've only presented this, uh, I presented it to one public forum so far, and there was a mixture of health professionals and and public there, and we really didn't get into that discussion. So I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure at this point uh, where we go with that. Okay. Okay. If uh, if I might add a little something to that, Janet, um, we I interact with a lot of people, not necessarily in the studies themselves, because uh, most of our studies were anonymous, so we didn't have at, at the bedside we didn't have much in the way of issue. But when this is being discussed in different fora, um, it what it does I find is illustrates a, a huge void in. Um, uh, mental health uh, in general. Oh, so oh, it's yeah. really not the fear of use of the test, but it's abuse of the test. So there's everyone sees the benefits for the newborn, um, but for women um, being identified, it's not the fact that they'll be identified, but what is going to follow that identification. Yeah. Um, and the reasons for that concern is because of ways in the past where women with substance abuse issues and alcohol abuse issues have been mistreated and underserved by yeah. by the system so yeah i i think you're right about that too joey um and i think that i mean i've been as dr corn said i feel like i've been on this for such a long time and it's not just about um alcohol it's about a whole range of issues that people are afraid to ask questions and then they're afraid after they ask the question, what do we do with it? And do we have the services to help these women? And I mean, it's, so it's so mixed in a whole lot of emotions and, and issues like that. I think you're, you're right, Joey. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, uh, we don't have any other questions. Um, so unless people are quickly have their fingers flying on the keyboard right now. Perhaps we'll just hand it uh, over to our panel for any, any final comments before we sign off. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who made this study possible because for us on PEI, I think it really is going to be the basis for some movement, which really needs to happen. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and thank uh, particularly Doug, Charlotte, and Elaine for, uh, for again, putting together uh, this really valuable webinar. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was certainly our pleasure. Uh, this, uh, the FASD content for our webinar series is always extreme. Uh, there's extreme interest across the CAFC community in this information. So thanks again to all of our presenters uh, for, for being with us today and for, or for giving us some of their time. Um, again, just to remind people, we typically do these every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Uh, next week, we actually have Wednesday off. Uh, and uh, our next webinar is another one of our FASD screening webinars and this one is uh, called identifying the invisible and it's about the screening tool that w is aimed at you aimed for use in the um, youth justice system so it's for probation officers and others in the corrections uh, in within the corrections institutes uh, in helping identify children in the uh, youth justice system that may be affected by FASD so that's uh, fr uh, Friday March 8th at 1 and uh, as always, you can go to our website at cafc.org slash cafc presents to, uh, to see the calendar for any other upcoming webinars after that. So uh, thanks again to all of our presenters and to everyone for attending. And hopefully we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks and bye. Bye, everybody.